Okay, so the subject of rewilding. Before I actually get into the subject, though, I suppose the first question is why are we talking about rewilding at all? Why do we think about it? Just as a bit of a background, well, actually, we're at a time when we need, I'm sure we all know, all know this, we need far higher ambition when it comes to nature conservation in this country. Um, we, we know the background, and I suppose the most recent thing, you may have all seen this, the State of Nature report that came out just the earlier, this, well, it was only a couple of weeks ago, I think, a few weeks ago, to look at what the state of nature is in the UK, and predictably, it's not very good. There's loads of statistics in there, but uh, this, what, this graph looking at priority species shows just how things are going. Um, this is population levels, and you see the decline in the population levels of priority species since 1970. Um, shows a significant decline, but actually 1970 wasn't, that, wasn't really that good to start with. So we, we know this background, we know things are not looking very good. And uh, there's loads of statistics, not from this, re this report, but from another report. Uh, this one staggers me. If you look at the total mass, the total weight of all mammals on Earth, 96% are humans or are livestock. 96% of all the mammals on Earth by weight are our livestock and us. Only 4% is everything else. I find that staggering. That shows how far we've spread into the natural world. Not, not plants, but it gives you the idea by looking at, uh, by looking at mammals in that case. Um, insects, we know they're also declining as well. Major threat to our pollinating insects, a so major threat to our plants as well, if, if, if that carries on. Um, and it's not just things a long way away, it's species in this country as well, the turtle dove. Some of you have probably heard the turtle dove probably a long time ago. It's now a very rare sight and sound in, this, in the countryside. 98% reduction, I think again since 1970, and it won't be very long before this is all just memory uh, that we never hear anymore, which would be very sad. The next species that's likely to go extinct in this country could be the turtle dove. So it's, it's, it's a big worry. And, and just to put a fi finer point on it, when we look back into deep history, there's been five mass extinction events like the one in the Permian mass extinction 250 million years ago, the one that saw off the dinosaurs about 65, 66 million years ago. And unfortunately, we have to accept that we are actually in the sixth mass extinction event now. We're right in the middle of a sixth major mass extinction event. And the cause of that? Well, we know the cause. The cause is actually us. Um, that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is, as we know the cure, the cause, we should also know the cure, the cure as well. And this is the background to the United Nations actually declaring the 2020s as the decade on ecosystem restoration, which they challenge it. It challenges us to massively upscale our efforts. We know we know we can do it. We know we can turn this around. But the the um, United Nations is now declaring that this decade is the decade we need to turn these things around. Now, that gets us to rewilding right at the start, though, I'd say that rewilding is not the only way to restore nature. I find it a useful starting point because it think, makes us think about how nature functions, but it's uh, not, not the only way. It's probably not even the right way or the best way in a lot of places, but it gets us to think about nature. And so what I want to do for the next little while is just talk about rewilding, what we mean about re is rewilding, and oh, excuse us to show a few pictures about rewilding based on the Nepa state. It'll, I'll be talking about vegetation and vegetation structure but I won't be talking much about individual plants, but you'll get the idea as I go through. Okay, so rewilding is effectively long-term, minimum intervention, natural process led. Now, I, I bet you'll realize every phrase in that, sen in that, uh, that, that uh, term has been, has been um, argued and will continue to be argued over. Uh, uh, rewilding is essentially restoring ecosystems by restoring the natural processes that drive ecosystems. So restoring nature by restoring the processes that drive nature. So that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, yes, all of these things are complex, so I'll go into this a little bit more. Um, so rewilding um, is rebuilding the system rather than or rather as, as well as kind of just conserving what's already there. So it's about rebuilding a system, re remaking those processes, getting those processes to actually work again. Great. When, when you hear rewilding, that's often what you hear. What I want to do is go into a little more detail about what that actually means. And in particular, I want to offer you a frame for how we think about rewilding, a, a kind of structure for thinking about rewilding, which kind of works in when you think about nature as a whole anyway. Uh, this is the sort of frame. You start off with by 
recreating those natural processes, getting nature to work again. If nature's working properly, then you'll create rich and diverse vegetation structures. Some of you probably remember John Lawton, Professor John Lawton, who wrote the State of Nature report, um, I think nearly over 12 years ago now. He had a good phrase, the species keep you honest. You can have all the most wonderful theory about nature you've, you, you like. If the species are declining, then your theory is wrong. So the wildlife, the biodiversity, what's actually happening to the species is, is most important to monitor. You know, are, the, are these natural processes working? Are the vegetation structures delivering the structure we need? That's can be, we can tell that by the biodiversity. Is it working? And if all that's working, then we can maybe make the assumption that the ecosystem itself is functioning more. Now, what I want to do is talk through each of those and say, say what, I, what I think it means, but it all starts with natural processes. So we start off with the natural processes. Now, quite often, I think uh, when people talk about rewilding, they kind of leave that hanging and you're supposed to know what we mean by natural processes. But I want to go into a little bit more detail about what that means. And it means this. It means vegetation succession in one direction and natural disturbance in another. Now, I hope this works because this, this is a dynamic relationship. That's good, isn't it? That's the extent of my PowerPoint skills. So it's the, it's the relationship between vegetation trying to grow, going through succession, trying to grow into forest on one side, and natural disturbance on the other. So you all know about this, I'm sure, being, being botanists, but vegetation succession. If we look at the example of NEP, this is what it looked like about 20 years ago. Leave it away, alone, keep away all the, um, all the influences on that area, and you see it gradually greening over and gradually the, the, the shrubs will come in, the trees will start to grow. And in just 15 or 20 years, you see the kind of spreading spread of growth right the way across the, that whole, let's see that again. So we see this spread of green growth, the, the, scrub, the scrub, the shrubs and the trees in a fairly short length of time across what was an, an agricultural um, landscape. Okay, so we start with maybe an open habitat, maybe a bit of, uh, bit of grassland. As we, as we all know what happens, the scrub starts to come in, the small shrubs, the, 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 um, the hawthorn and so on. And gradually a thicket stage forms. This is a view from the middle of Weald looking south across the downs. Uh, this is the thicket stage forming after a decade or two. And then eventually you get to high forest or closed canopy forest. Now in the past, I think people thought that was it. That's the end of the story. Now this is succession towards, I'm sure you've heard this, the idea of a climatic climax, a climax forest. For every, every, every climate zone, there's supposed to be a climax forest that was supposed to dominate over the whole area. For a long time, we thought that's what this was in this country. You've probably all heard the story, and you know, thousands of years ago, a squirrel could hop from Land's End to John O'Groats without ever treading on the ground. Some people still talk about that. That's interesting, it's useful, but actually it's far less than half the story. When we think about it, and I'm sure it's true with a lot of plants that you all know about very, very well indeed, very few, certainly far less than half of our biodiversity actually relies on dense closed canopy forest. That's interesting. Even the things that we think of as forest species often have part of their life cycle which needs open habitat. Some of the, um, uh, some of the wood boring insects that bore into these trees and we think of as forest species, actually they need nectar at other times of the year. So they're found on the edges of forests and in open habitat, where you only get that nectar source where the sun can get in. Even species that we think of as uh, forest species, like, like hazel, for example, you probably all know that if the forest gets too dense, if a, a woodland is left unmanaged, then actually hazel doesn't do very well indeed. In some of our own nature reserves, which are non-intervention zones, hazel is declining quite significantly. Even if it grows, it doesn't actually produce much in the way of pollen. It doesn't flower very well. And the only way we can tell how common hazel was in the past is by the fossil evidence that's been left behind. 8,000 years ago, there was masses of hazel in this country, but it can't have been in dense woodland. Similarly with oak, oak doesn't regenerate very well in dense woodland. And all the species that rely on oak often rely on oak grown in the open. So you get this picture. There could have been some, possibly quite a lot of dense forest in a presumed natural state, but it wasn't the only story. And the other thing that's going on is, of course, natural disturbance. So what do I mean by natural disturbance? OK, well, there's all sorts of clues. Um, I'm sure some of us were around in 1987 when there was huge amounts of storm damage from the 1987 storm. I say damage, but it wasn't damage. It was 
what happens is that it was an impact. It was nature working for itself. It was opening up the forest canopy, allowing light in. All the regeneration then followed. However, I, when, I, when, I, when I was here, when I was w working in Sussex, uh, I came in to do some research work on the 1987 storm. And I thought, well, that's the answer. That's how forests function. That's how they regenerate. But unfortunately, one storm every 300 years, which is it had a 300 year return time, is not enough to account for all the diversity that we have in our woodlands. But it's a clue. It's a clue that actually natural disturbance is as much part of forest ecology as succession is. And there are other things which cause natural disturbance. Uh, here we have some examples of some big beasts that, are, that were found in deep history around the northern temperate zones. This is not just Britain, this is actually across, across Europe. A um, couple of points about these. We can't use these now because because some of them are extinct. And actually, even if they weren't extinct, I'm not sure we'd want to use them. That uh, cow in the middle at the top there, that's the wild auroc. Uh, you probably all know about the wild auroc, but for those of you who don't, it's the predecessor of our domestic cow, which sounds cuddly enough. But a wild auroc, if you can imagine the biggest cow you've ever seen, make it at least six inches taller and give it a really bad attitude, that was the one that, that was the wild aurochs. How anybody thought to catch it and try and milk it, I don't know, but that was the forerunner of our um, of our wild of our domestic cow. Now these beasts would have a huge impact on the forest and forest ecology. Um, they didn't just live in the forest, they actually drove forest ecology. Uh, they would have a significant impact. But we don't have those there, those those animals now. Uh, and if we did have them, we probably wouldn't want to use them in some of our, our um, cosier areas, like in the southeast of England. So, but what we can do is we can use domestic proxies for wild animals. And that's a phrase I use a lot when I'm talking to people about rewilding. It's domestic proxies for wild animals. So these aren't, aren't wild, not most of them anyway. They are domestic. They do have the same uh, concerns as a domestic animal. But they're encouraged to work in as wild a way as possible in rewilding projects, particularly in NEP. So we don't have any wild boar. They are in part parts of Sussex, but we don't have them in net. But we do have the Tamworth pig. We don't have the uh, the wild aurochs. Nobody does. But we do have the English longhorn. We don't have the uh, now extinct wild wild horse, the tarpan. But we do have Exmoor ponies, which, by the way, look almost identical to the original wild pony. We also have the species of deer here. Now these are all in the Nepa state, all behaving in a really wild way, and all acting as proxies for the natural disturbance that would have happened from these great big beasts that used to be here. Okay, so they're domestic proxies for wild herbivores. And just looking at some of these working, but here's, here's a, a, few, a few clips that I hope you can see at your end, maybe a bit stilted, but you'll get the idea. Here are the Tamworth pigs, and they're little, well, somebody described them as bacon-flavoured JCBs. They go around ploughing up everything, um, one sow can plough 40 acres in a year. They have a huge impact. Um, one, one block of the Nepa state is 800 acres in size. We only have six pigs there because of the impact they have. They almost behave like hip hippopotamuses in some places. So they have this kind of disturbance effect, turning over the soil, bringing up all the, all the regeneration and so on. We then have, the, um, have the, uh, the, the red deer. Well, three species of deer there. We have the, um, have the red deer, we've got fallow deer. Uh, which are not native, but we also have the roe deer as well. But if we look at these pictures, you can see they're interacting with their landscape. They're actually grazing, obviously, and browsing, but also the act of fighting. They leave considerable impact on the vegetation and the landscape, simply where they're fighting. Uh, they rub their antlers up and down trees and debark them, making often killing trees and opening up the forest. So they have a direct effect. Then we have the ponies as well. All of these animals graze and browse in a different sort of way. They have different sorts of mouth parts. They do a different ecological job within a forest ecology. Ponies, I think, are much more, they, they graze more closely to the ground. They are much more in the open areas and keeping them open. And all of these animals are much more selective than we ever realised they would be. You watch them closely, they're deliberately selecting some, some species when they fancy them. It's very interesting to see what they do, give them a chance. And lastly, well, last but not least, is my personal favourite, the English longhorn cows. These look big and savage, but actually they're pussycats, certainly in comparison to a wild auroch. Um, and again, look at the way they're behaving. They're not just eating green grass. Sometimes of the year they spend most of their time browsing, which obviously has an impact on the landscape. 
And so again, they're having an impact on how the forest regenerates, what, what form it takes when it's growing. This kind of battle going on between trees trying to form dense forest and natural disturbance trying to knock it back again. Okay. Let's go over, yeah, let's look at this, um, um, this model that we have of open habitat going through succession and then turning into a mature habitat. That's the uh, kind of model we start, start with and the idea that that then grows up into climax forest. Well, as I've described, a useful starting point, a useful context, and it probably occurs in some places, but it's not the whole story by a long way. Um, what actually happens is we have natural disturbance continually resetting the clock on succession therefore creating openness and open habitat. Obviously, a, a question in your minds, I'm sure, is going to be, well, what controls the grazing and browsing? Well, in nature, it's the predators through a process we've come to, to call the ecology of fear. Uh, grazing animals are not just, it's not just their numbers are kept down, their behaviour changes in the presence of predators. If they think there's a predator around, they move very quickly. They don't go where they're going to be ambushed. They move on quickly. They don't, don't go hang around around a wolf den. They tend to herd and cluster and they can defend themselves, which means some areas get browsed quite heavily, other areas get browsed much less. In nature conservation, perhaps our, a, a bigger problem is not overgrazing or even undergrazing. The biggest problem is even grazing. If you hold, have a whole landscape grazed to the same level, then actually that causes an evenness when you, what you want is diversity. So what drives this patchiness in grazing is the ecology of fear. It's interesting when you think about rewilding, because often what we're talking about when we're talking about how you manage in a re rewilding context are the things that are missing. And very often, particularly in this country, the thing that is missing is the ecology of fear. So how do you replicate that in a rewilding project? I'm not going to answer that. I'll leave that question hanging. OK, so the ecology of fear, uh, what does that actually mean? Where does that uh, lead us? Well, it actually opens up another sort of um, phrase that you may have heard. Um, the idea of trophic rewilding. Um, well, trophic levels, I'm sure you know, these are very, very simplified. These are trophic levels. So the first level, primary producers, they're your plants, they're eaten by herbivores, and the herbivores are eaten by your top predators. This is all familiar stuff, I'm sure. You need an awful lot of plants to support quite a large um, herbivore population, which in turn supports a tiny predator population. This isn't obviously to scale. I think it's a you need at least 10 times more mass lower down the each level. So this gives you an idea that uh, this is the kind of food web um, thing that I'm, I'm sure we all know about. Now, if we actually think about um, biomass, obviously the, the biomass is far greater in the primary producers in order to support the herbivores, in order to support the, the predators. But there's also impact. And the impact on lower trophic levels is caused by for example, predators. So predators have an impact on the herbivores and herbivores have an impact on the plants. That's all obvious stuff, I think. But actually, when you hear the phrase trophic rewilding, what's trying to be achieved is to repopulate all these trophic levels so that the ecosystem functions fully. So it's the idea of trophic rewilding, making sure that you can actually get um, each trophic level fully populated with the relevant plants and animals. Um, and as I say, that's not always popular and not always possible. So superimposing what I've just said, open habitat through succession to mature habitat, that's happening with your plants under the influence of disturbance from grazing and browsing in the next, from the next trophic level, which itself is influenced by the ecology of fear caused by predators in the trophic level above that. Now you may have also heard the, uh, the concept of trophic cascade. You change something at one trophic level by introducing the wolf, for example, and that'll, the effect of wolf trickles down through the rest of the trophic levels. Good. So these are the natural processes, succession versus natural disturbance, trophic rewilding, bring, making sure those trophic levels, if possible, are, 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 are occupied fully. Uh, and also superimposed across all of that is, of course, hydrology and therefore landfall. You know, are, the, are the water courses um, working naturally? Very often they're not. OK, so if that's all working, that's a kind of discussion through natural processes boiled right down to a couple of key ones. Um, if that's all working, then you'll get rich and diverse vegetation structures. This is what we see in NEP. We see something which was an agricultural landscape turning into something which is a patchwork 
of um, young trees surrounded by spiny shrubs. Uh, when they're in the open like this one, they're grazed and will probably eventually die and that'll be a grassland. But right next door, uh, not this one, but just behind it, you'll see some spiny shrubs uh, with trees probably roughly the same age as the other one. And uh, they're protected from grazing. So they'll become the groves or individual trees or even quite large areas of forests in the future. So the idea of spiny shrubs protecting regrowing trees, usually oak trees. If you think about that, you get the complexity building up almost automatically. Big old trees surrounded by spiny shrubs, which are amazing nectar sources, surrounded themselves by areas of grazing. So you get this, this complexity. You end up with something which looks a bit like this, um, just one or two trees here, surrounded by the spiny shrubs. Now in NEP, this is an aerial photograph, we see the effect. This area that should be circled in red, that's actually an ancient woodland called Tory Copse, actually. That's an, that's, a, that's an ancient woodland. The area to the, um, to the right of it, that was all arable land just 20 years ago. What's happened, of course, is the trees have spread out. Um, jays have planted the acorns, some of the trees have been wind, wind, wind spread and so on. But the trees colonize and against that, you have the browsers and grazers in this dynamic relationship um, stopping the trees spread. If you look at that landscape, it's got gaps and tracks and things working through it. They're all created by the effect, impacts of grazing and browsing. They're not artificial. And we also have the effect of the pigs as well, standing into the wild boar. So you see these great kind of turned over area, the pig rootling. It's called rootling. I think in, 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 in word, you, you end up with a red line under the word rootling, but there we go. Good. What we say this creates, matrix of habitat is quite nice, but actually because it's always shifting, always changing, we quite like the term a kaleidoscope of shifting habitat. You know, when you used to look through a kaleidoscope, all the colours changed. It's a little bit like that. Great. Well, if you've got that working, if actually the natural processes are working, you've got your rich, but rich structures, is this really reflected in the biodiversity? Is it really true that this is actually improving things or not? So certainly in NEP, but actually in most of the rewilding projects, um, people do go to quite some lengths to monitor to see whether things are improving. The situation in NEP is, um, well, yes, it's, it's improving massively. Um, these da this data is out of date now. Um, over 30,000 records collecting at NEP, well now well over 3,000 species, including not just things that colonise, but actually some quite interesting species as well. Biodiversity action plan species, nationally scarce species, red list birds. Interestingly, or perhaps less interestingly, it's not that good when it comes to flora, because actually this was just an ordinary farm not long ago. Um, so where would the plants come from? So it's getting a richer mixture of the species that were already there. But I think it'll take a lot longer for some of the more interesting plants to appear. But when it comes to animals, um, NEP is developing into a regional and national hotspot. Cuckoos are increasing where they're, they're decreasing everywhere else. Nightingales, there was perhaps one territory 20 years ago, it says 19 there. Last year, there were 50 singing males. It's now one of the best places in Britain for Purple Emperor. We get, we're getting Beckstein's bats and, and, and Barberstel bats, which are, again, nationally rare. You know, you're rare on a European scale. So if you monitor the species, things are improving. Things are doing better. Turtle dove, that's increasing as well. Okay, so that's fine. So it does seem that the species are increasing. Ecosystem function, what we understand by that, uh, that's probably a huge seminar. I can't say much about that. Mm -hmm. But how do we know whether an ecosystem is functioning well or not? Well, I think a good place to start is to look at the soil. What's happening to the soil? If the soil is doing well, then perhaps the whole ecosystem is functioning. It's a good indication that, that the, an ecosystem is functioning. So there's been quite a lot of work done at NEP to see what's actually happening to the soil. And it's surprising all of us just how things are changing. I don't know whether there's sound on this. Don't think so, no. This was Charlie Burrell, the owner of the NEP estate, talking proudly about all the dung beetles that are present on this one large cow pad. He's quite an enthusiast for dung beetles and has many happy hours dissecting um, cow pads on his kitchen table to find out what species there are there. And there are a lot. And it seems there's some sort of relationship between the, the herbivores, the dung, the soil and, and the flora and the fauna that lives on the, on the dung, which is increasing the carbon content of the soil. And what we're finding in comparison to a arable control soil, NEP now has 
soil carbon that's more than doubled. That's more than doubled in 20 years. That's incredible. We, I don't think anybody expected soil to recover quite that quickly. A link to that, the organic matter, again, has almost doubled. And some of the biomarkers for um, soil microbes are showing very significant recovering, recovery. So uh, all of these indicators about, of the soil um, are going in the right direction. And actually, they're going in the direction much quicker than we imagined. Um, I haven't got the figures in front of me, but the, the figures for um, how quickly soil builds up, I think often quoted it's a, an inch in 100 years. Well, soil here is building up much quicker than that. Um, interestingly here, I should have said right at the start, the reason why this, this is a rewilding project is because if you know the world of Sussex, it's incredibly difficult to farm. Farmers often fail uh, when it comes to trying to farm in the world of Sussex. And this was a failing farm. It had hardly ever made a profit and he didn't have the money to need to take the necessary investment. That's why it went into rewilding. So the soil, what's happening to the soil is really interesting. Horrible sticky sticky clay with no nutrients in it, which bakes hard in summer and, and is impossible in winter. That's the sort of soil we're looking at. And yet the characteristics of the soil through rewilding are improving in all sorts of ways. Dung beetle survey was done. 11, 12,000 individual beetles found in one sample versus an organic site, which is about 600. So you can see, probably because of the animals that are there uh, in this relationship with the, um, the vegetation, we're getting incredible amounts of soil fauna. Uh, obviously, soil has a functional importance. It ameliorates water through that flows through it. Very useful these days in times of flooding. Uh, soil stability, reduced erosion. If the soil is doing well, then all these soil characteristics are improved. Aeration, permeability. Um, the infiltration rate, that's very important as well. Instead of wa water washing off in a flood, uh, if the soil is good, then it actually infil filters into the soil, which is good to prevent flooding. It's also good to actually build up the aquifer um, um, un un under underground when it comes to water. Okay, uh, obviously soil is also the growth and rooting medium for everything that follows. So soil has a massive functional importance. The soil is doing well, the odds are the whole ecosystem is doing well. OK, I suppose just to kind of summarise at this point, rewilding starts off by being really being a way of thinking uh, rather than anything grand in terms of changing what you do necessarily. Um, rewilding, if you're thinking about restoring natural processes, rebuilding nature so that nature can function more for itself, then actually what you're doing, that's rewilding. You're trying to put nature back in place so if it can, it can function for itself. Um, Alternatively, instead of having something which is process-led, rewilding is not outcome-led. There is no targets in rewilding. It's about putting the processes in place and allowing them to flourish. That's rewilding. But most nature conservation, most agriculture, most forestry is outcome-led. Uh, quite legitimately, if you have rare plants, then obviously you need to con cons conservation manage to keep those rare plants. But you can mimic natural processes. You can learn from natural processes to see how you can mimic them in the better management of your outcome-led approach. Well, that's basically sympathetic management. So it's basically just a slight difference. Well, it's, it's a fundamental difference in the way you think, but actually they can inform each other. And that's important. And I think a big thing that I, I teach, uh, teach is the wrong word, but I, but I uh, uh, hold courses, uh, safaris, on uh, rewilding for small landowners at the Nepa State, which are great. I mean, you get so much enthusiasm there. So uh, um, yeah, small landowners come to think about rewilding. But an important point is where, well, where would you do rewilding and where wouldn't you do rewilding? Sometimes it's presented as a golden bullet for everywhere. It's, it's not true. There are all sorts of considerations. Um, you would probably think about rewilding on land of least risk. You probably wouldn't do it where there's a special or sensitive wildlife, which is probably the product of careful management or traditional management. So you, you wouldn't do rewilding everywhere, it wouldn't necessarily be your first choice. You probably would look at it first on land of low value agricultural land, low, low value forestry land, or possibly low value conservation land. So where there's least risk. But if you've got land with a clear objective, that probably isn't where you do rewilding. So you had a rare orchid, which is linked to particular management. I think it's unlikely you'd go to rewilding first there. Similarly though, if your objective is agriculture, then that you wouldn't do rewilding there or forestry. 
you could look at rewilding, you could try and understand it, you could um, try and understand natural processes and maybe use that to inform the way you do your management. But in these areas where there's a clear objective, you probably wouldn't do rewilding. I has to hesitate here though, because actually sometimes we give ourselves excuses. Sometimes we think we have to manage the way we've always managed because that's the only way to get the outcome we want. Sometimes it's very good to refresh. Is this really true? Does this wood really want coppicing? Is there another way of creating this disturbance? And so on. So you can think about things again. You may come up with the same answer, but I think it's very good to have a refresh and not just give ourselves the same excuses. So we just carry on doing what we've always done. Great. I'm often asked about scale. And the question we get is how big does a rewilding project need to be? Great. I guess a few of you coming in today will have, will have thought about that. Um, in my mind, it's the wrong question. So that's not the right question. <laughs> the right question in my mind is what area is needed to support the ecological processes you're trying to restore? OK, so what I'm going to do now is start, start at the top and work down in terms of what I think that might mean. So starting at the top, what area do we need to support top predators? <laughs> well, that's a pretty big area. The lynx, the Eurasian lynx, I think it's true to say, has the biggest territory of any cat in the world. So you're going to need a pretty big area to have a viable population of lynx. What about all these other guys as well? Somebody said to me once, if we introduce wolf to Scotland, we're going to have to tell people in Cornwall that they're on the way. And I don't know what we do about bears. So you're going to need a vast area to think about reintroducing some of these species. I think we probably trip ourselves up if we think rewilding is all about only this, and therefore we have to have arguments about whether we introduce brown bears or wolves. Um, yes, it's worth discussing, but it's not the be all and end all of rewilding. And you need such a vast scale. We need to look down the scale as well. We need to look maybe at some of the other species. What um, scale do we need if we're gonna have interacting herds of wild herbivores? So not your domestic animals, but your wild ones. In Holland, a place called Estvardesplassen. It's taken me 20 years to learn how to pronounce that. I still get it wrong. Uh, in Estvardesplassen over in Holland, they class that as wild. The animals there are, well, they were domestic, but they have been classed as wild and they have to live or die as wild animals. It brings with it its own controversies, which perhaps we can talk about. But these animals are treated as wild animals um, and left to basically get on with it. In... Yeah, so all these, these species, um, they're, they're, not all of those are actually in Astvardasplassen, but you could reintroduce these things and class them as wild and to leave them to actually behave as wild animals. Um, in, I think, virtually all the rewilding projects in Britain, certainly in NEP, we've gone to the next level down, which is the area that you need for domestic proxies of wild grazers. They're domestic. We have the same responsibility as any domestic animal. Uh, they're managed as little as possible. You see that one there has got ear tags. They're all ear tagged. Uh, we have a vet on site to make sure they're, they're, they're healthy. They always are. They're the healthiest animals you'll come across, um, but they are domestic. Um, so, but we encourage them to have as natural a herd structure as possible to graze and browse in as natural a way as they can. So we're using domestic proxies, but actually there's still a management requirement there but management at NEP is all about how you manage the animals, how you, how you guide the animals. And there's, there's no management when it comes to vegetation. And if you're thinking about all of these, then actually um, the sort of scale you'll need is, let's say a thousand acres, something like that. You need a big area to allow these things to just be there all through the year, behaving as wild a way as possible, with the management being how you control the population sizes. Next scale down, is what area do you need if you basically want to have grazers and browsers on a site all through the year? I've mischievously put sheep in there because actually sheep are not part of rewilding in this country, but they are conservation grazers. We use them a lot in the Sussex Wildlife Trust to, to create one of the richest habitats uh, at a small scale in Europe, the, the, the South Downs Chalk Grassland, for example. But unless anybody would, would like to argue with me, I don't think they're rewilding. However, some of our chunky breed of cows, they're more like a rewilding um, approach. You put them in there, they're largely, um, largely natural. Um, we do have to manage them. Sometimes if you go down a scale, you put anim animals on and take them off through the year in order to mimic the effect of herds moving through an area. Now, as you go smaller, if you go to a smaller scale, then your mindset changes. You haven't got the scale to introduce 
disturbance or a disturbance feature. What you have to do is manage the disturbance regime to match the space that you have. And it all starts to look a bit familiar, a bit like, like ordinary management, but the mindset is different. So if you're doing a conservation grazing type rewilding approach, as in the bottom picture there, um, you may have to move animals on and take them off because you've only got a certain amount of land. And in, in order to create that can I copy of wilding, you can only do it by moving animals on and off. So therefore you have layback land, as in the top two pictures, where you're taking your animals off and putting them somewhere else um, for part of the year. So you use them in the wilding project for other parts of the year. Going down in scale again, you may have to pretend to be the animals yourself. If you've only got an acre or two, obviously you're not going to have a herd of cows there or, or, or any pigs, but you may have to pretend to be a beaver by, by going there and chewing up the trees with that, um, that great chipper there. Or you may have to pretend to be an, an elk or a, or a wild aurochs by cutting and then removing it with a, with a fork, like in the other picture there. So here you could say this is conservation management, or you can say it's machinery mimicking the effect of particular natural processes. And of course, we couldn't, we might be able to rely on so-called nat native, they're not all native, but kind of natural grazers that are there already. This is interesting to think about in an urban situation. Some urban sites may be more rewilded than some of our rural sites because they're already being impacted by animals that are already there. Things like roe deer, which are native, and also rabbits. We're not going to get rid of them. They're, having, they're, they're driving the ecology of an area. So it may be that particularly some of our urban areas, there are already these grazers impacting on the process of succession. This is just a kind of um, summary of, uh, it's my own Mickey Mouse idea really, as you increase in size, you can increase in naturalness, which means you can have less and less management. So the bigger the size, the more you can just go towards non-intervention. The nature of the way you manage changes. It's not just doing more of the same. Very small sites, you manage the vegetation. Slightly bigger, you manage domestic animals. Slightly bigger than that, then you manage the domestic proxies. Bigger still, then you, you have the domestic proxies, but your management goes down and down. Maybe then you go up further, further up the tree and you'll have a wild herds and you mimic the effect of predators. Right up at the top of the scale, you have everything in place, including the predators. I've kind of guessed at some figures there, but you'll get the idea. OK, and this what's one question that is it should be in everyone's mind is, well, how do you manage if you don't know what your output is going to be? How do you know what success is like? And there isn't an answer there for this. This is a conversation at a small site. Um, this is what we tend to do. We have a small site, therefore it's managed for a particular objective. We can set the objective and therefore we can measure whether we're doing okay or not. That's great. But to some extent, we're marking our own homework, aren't we? If we go up uh, in, in, in scale, um, the more you manage, the less it's natural. Right at the top there, as the size of a landscape, you can't really have highly specific objectives for every feature in the landscape. What you can do, however, is set yourself wide limits of acceptable change. So you're not managing for a specific objective, you're managing for the whole system, but you can't just let it run because we don't even know what natural is. So you set yourself wide limits of acceptable change. You do that on a large scale. Halfway up, you can start to think about, um, well, maybe we can be more adaptive in our management. Maybe we can have fluid objectives. As nature changes because of the process of, the progress of natural processes, we can be more fluid in what sort of objectives we can actually um, deliver. So this is the kind of, I suppose, potential way of thinking about it. Um, it's an ongoing issue as to how do you measure the success of a rewilding project when you haven't got objectives, not certainly not you know, narrow objectives. So how do you prove that you're doing well? Um, interesting. And as I say, it's a conversation, there's not an answer. Okay, I'm gonna finish now in a little while with a vision of change, just to kind of put a picture in your mind about how landscape could change with the concept of rewilding included in that. We could start off with this. This is a real picture, an artist's impression of a real area, real landscape, I think in the north of England. Um, it, green, green and pleasant land looks quite pleasant, but actually when you look a little closer, you see, well, the green is all the same color green. It's probably all ryegrass. And you look at the hedgerows, they're really very narrow and quite gappy. The habitats are very isolated, they're few and far between and separated from each other. Roads are cutting across and uh, there's a scoured river going off to the right there. Um, the village in the background is at the end of a very scoured straight river, so is at, 
uh, to risk of flooding because of the way the the peak of the river of the of the flood in the river can get, get downstream so it looks nice but you look a little bit closer and you think well maybe maybe that can be improved now you could maybe foresee a potential to rewild areas you see to the at the left there i've just added in a small rewilded area and in the background in the uplands you may be rewilding some of the areas there maybe these are areas of low productivity where they're not a value for for um for agriculture um that's great um but it's still quite isolated so maybe we can think about well can we form corridors to actually join up areas of nature conservation areas of rewilding and so on um, i've mischievously put some um, um, herds of bison roaming across these corridors can we link over um, roads for example with land bridges to see if we can actually enable things to move and adapt over a large scale i think we have about two or three land bridges in this country holland has got hundreds there's loads and loads of land bridges in holland where where these natural processes are encouraged to function across whole landscapes. So you can think about whether we can join up these areas. We can also think about the land in between. Um, maybe there are ways of, in fact, there are ways of farming in a different way. So, so land becomes permeable to wildlife. So instead of, of uh, agricultural land becoming a barrier to wildlife, it becomes something they can move through, you know, plants and animals can move through in, with re reasonable ease. So maybe ideas like regenerative agriculture, permaculture, uh, pasture woodland management is an example there. All sorts of new ways of, of ma land management to make it more amenable to wildlife. Maybe we can just encourage our hedgerows to billow out a bit more. There's an estate in Sussex which is highly intensively managed. It's the opposite end of the end of the spectrum to um, NEP, where um, all they've done is actually take out 10% of their, their agricultural land in conservation headlands around all the big fields, 10% taken out of productivity. Interestingly, that hasn't resulted in any loss in actual productivity. So the rest of the, of the land is, is increased in productivity. Meanwhile, conservation headlands have enabled the area to be much more permeable to wildlife. So that's a possible as well. And also we can look at the river. Um, this is something that's happening in all sorts of places now. I think we're really getting attuned to the idea that our rivers are too straight, too deep, too scoured out. And they're actually causing flood problems rather than curing them. The way to actually address our, our flood problems is to slow the flow of water. And one way of doing that is by rewilding river courses, um, by maybe putting beavers back in again. That's a subject we're looking very carefully at at the moment. There are beavers just been reintroduced in net. We can get beavers back into our wetlands, or if you don't have beavers, if we can encourage the wetland to function more naturally, then it holds back the water, reduces flood risk, actually, actually, actually locks up carbon as well, is very, very good for biodiversity and so on. Interestingly, I saw some figures just, just last week. If we did this in all of our rivers and put a buffer zone each side of all of our rivers and all of our tributaries um, by, have, by reintroducing beavers, that takes out a lot of agricultural land. But how much? I think a, a university did a study and worked out that would take out 5% of our agricultural land. Now, even if that produced no food, but it probably would, but even if it produced no food, then by taking out that area of land and allowing the rivers to function more naturally, we would reduce the effect of floods and reduce the effect of drought. And therefore, the rest of the agricultural land would probably be far more productive than the loss of 5% caused by the rivers. Just, a, just something I picked up the other day. Great. Coming to the end now, so just a quick summary before I close down. Rewilding is primarily a way of thinking. What you do with that, you can play with in all sorts of ways. It's about rebuilding nature, putting natural processes back, back in place, rather than direct management. Obviously, it overlaps, but rather than mani the, the direct manipulation of vegetation, is by re recreating these processes. So it's about rebuilding a system rather than conserving what's there. The outcomes, I don't think I've mentioned this before, the outcomes that you do get are not managed outcomes, they're emergent properties, things you didn't know you were gonna get. So they're emergent properties, not objectives. And it works with broad limits of acceptable change or adaptive management rather than narrow objectives. So it avoids narrow objectives. It actually appreciates diversity and surprise and so on. It's, it's the ability to be surprised by a wild system, which I think is one of the, the aims we get to with rewilding. And just a, Bring it all together at the end. I think it reflects two philosophies in nature conservation. Um, the first, and both are both are equally equally relevant. 
Both are right in the right places. First is the idea of careful stewardship for which over the assets that we're responsible for. If we've got a nature reserve, we've got rare habitats, we've got rare species, rare plants, rare, rare animals, then actually careful stewardship of that by careful management, taking responsibility for it, is you know, a very strong and very good philosophy. So careful stewardship of assets. The other philosophy is the idea of a bigger natural system. And we're its servant, not its master. We're within this big natural system. So, so therefore, it's not just about making nature do what we want it to do. It's actually about recognizing that we're within that system and it's a, the, the, the approach of actually rebuilding that system. Now, they overlap, obviously. I think you can hold both views at once, which is always fun. Um, and they're particularly, they're, they're relevant to different extents in different areas. And just to finish now, what I want to say is this picture is not a wild experience. Why? Well, you can tell that uh, Darren Smith, whose picture it is, he must have set this up. He must have had a fantastic hide. He probably took hundreds, perhaps thousands of pictures where he knew that the Kingfisher was going to go uh, in order to get the perfect picture. This is great. I'm not denigrating it at all. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, full credit for anybody who can get a picture like this. But you can't really claim it's a wild experience. This is a wild experience. Very proud of this. Can you see it? Just to give you a clue. There it is. This is my wife's picture. She is walking past the waterfall and suddenly unknown and unpredicted, uh, there was a kingfisher. Isn't that amazing? Without realizing, without knowing, suddenly a kingfisher appears. The, the excitement of seeing something that you weren't expecting, particularly a kingfisher as it flashes across. Obviously she dropped her camera, picked it up again, took a picture, very proud of it. Um, that was a kingfisher. Um, and I think that's the point. It's to be able to be surprised, have something that you didn't know you were gonna get, maybe even be a little bit frightened. You know, nature working for itself, we're there as part of it and maybe, maybe an observer, maybe a, a, a participant as well. But that's all about um, being able to be surprised by what happens in nature and all the better for it.